Welcome to today's webinar from Lumen Learning. I am Julie Curtis. I am Vice President of Strategy at Lumen. I'm joined today by our co-founder and Chief Academic Officer, David Wiley. He will uh, be presenting. Um, we're also joined by our Chief, uh, uh, Chief Operations Officer, Tom, uh, Tom Chapman. Today, we are excited to dig deeper into a new offering that we announced last week. It's called Lumen Circles. We'll talk about what Lumen Circles are, why we are going this direction as a company, and the difference that we're trying to make with effective teaching and learning and student success with this offering. We'll give you a preview of what it looks like and also the kind of faculty professional development experiences that we're designing with a really interesting and unique set of tools and activities that, um, that Lumen Circles brings together. So uh, first, though, I want to do a quick poll. And um, this one is just a, a quick uh, ground setting. I see a lot of familiar names in our, uh, as well as some new names in our participant list. So please take a moment and uh, respond to this poll. adding up the numbers in my head to see when we get uh, most everybody participating. All right, I think we've got most everybody in. So I will end the poll and we can take a look at the results. Let's see, okay. So, um, so this is helpful. We have a fair number of people that are somewhat or very familiar with Lumen, a few people who, for whom Lumen is very new. So that's awesome. We're glad to have everybody here. And, um, and relatively low familiarity with uh, Faculty Guild. Um, I uh, should ask, um, can people see the poll results? Hopefully that's something that has, uh, okay, perfect. <laughs> in, the, in the speaker view, it's sometimes a little bit tricky uh, to know exactly what people are seeing and what they're not seeing. So, all right, uh, so let's keep going. Um, for many people, Lumen Learning is pretty familiar, um, but for those who are not, um, just a very quick um, introduction. So Lumen got its start as part of a series of grant projects that were funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, we got started uh, back in 2012 officially. The grant project started before that. Um, and, and really we hit a stride as we were focusing on um, some approaches to improving success for at-risk learners using open educational resources, open content. We started with a really strong focus on affordability and access to course materials and we were quickly as we started that work um, found that there was a lot of opportunity to expand um, and so we do a lot around evidence-based learning design and support to faculty members so that they're comfortable shifting towards these types of innovative and more affordable options and making them really highly effective both for faculty members and for students. Our most exciting work has been around how do we make the learning experience really effective for students, especially for at-risk students who often struggle in digital environments. We work primarily with institutions that serve high proportions of Pell eligible students and we're growing rapidly. Um, we have actually a, you know, a, a broad set of institutions that we work with today and it's growing every year. Last year, we supported around 2,000 faculty members at 350 different colleges and universities around the United States. So around 260,000 students were using, uh, uh, using our courseware in, in classes. And um, it's been exciting to see that work over time and see it expand. And also um, with, this, uh, with this new announcement around Lumen Circles, um, being able to take that broader direction that we're striving for around impacting effective teaching and learning and take it in some new directions. Um, one of the things that we, uh, that is inspiring to us, um, and a lot of this is driven by 
things that our co-founder uh, David Wiley shares with the team and brings to our attention. Um, but the work of Herbert Simon is something that's becoming more familiar to our team and is a point of inspiration for a lot of what we do. Um, Dr. Simon was, you might consider, an above average thinker and a faculty member at Carnegie Mellon University. He won both the Turing Prize for his work in computer science and also a Nobel Prize for his work in economics. He was a pioneer in developing our collective understanding about how learning happens and the psychology of human cognition. Um, among his many insights is this quotation that we pull out and consider often. To summarize, it's saying that learning results only from what the student does and thinks, and the role of a teacher is to influence what the student is doing. So in other words, if we want to impact learning, one lever we can use is the student side. How are we giving students better tools, better activities, creating better motivations for them to learn? And another lever that we can use is also on the faculty side. How can we help teachers, the faculty members, apply highly effective practices and learning strategies that will support their student success. Oops. So that brings us to what we do at Lumen. We are focused on effective teaching and learning practices and providing a variety of different ways to support that activity. Um, we have up to this point have focused heavily on evidence-based learning tools, courseware, um, and as we do that, we're looking continually at ways to build more effective learners, to build more impactful teachers, and recognize that all of it is really essential to making a larger difference in student success. So very specifically for those who are new-ish to Lumen, um, we have uh, our courseware that is a core piece of what we do. And now we are adding Lumen Circles for faculty professional development um, with a focus on helping instructors become more effective in their teaching strategies, regardless of what course materials they use, what discipline, what modality. And so we'll spend most of today actually talking about that. That's why you're here and that's why we're here. So uh, to jumpstart our work with faculty professional development, we acquired the professional development platform and methodology of Faculty Guild. We announced this last week, Faculty Guild is a coaching service that was created in 2017 by David Yaskin and a talented team that worked with him there. And Lumen is bringing these elements uh, from the Faculty Guild approach into a unique fellowship type experience to help build skills and share feedback and help people uh, apply and learn about effective teaching practices and collaborate through peer-based learning circles. So we'll talk about kind of all that package and how it comes together. But um, I want to shift gears and actually hand the floor to David Wiley to talk about why Faculty Guild, why now, why are we heading this direction, and to then take us into a preview of the things that we're doing uh, with this new, uh, this new offering. So David, go ahead. Thanks, Julie. Um, you know, as Julie was saying, Lumen's focus has always been on increasing student success, and particularly student success for students who are at risk. And for many years, we did that by trying to uh, leverage open educational resources, leverage instructional design, uh, leverage supporting technologies, and bring that all together in, a, in integrated courseware. Um, I don't think it's any surprise to, to anyone on the webinar to, uh, to hear that the teacher actually has a, a much larger role uh, in facilitating the success of a student than any textbook or homework platform or uh, courseware can. And so as we continue to look at how we can improve student success and what we can do, um, eventually you, you kind of run into, uh, run into a ceiling when the only lever that you have to pull, as Julie uh, was saying, uh, is making improvements to courseware. The faculty play a much larger role in student success. And so we you know, became interested in this idea of how can we provide better support, more direct support, um, to faculty to help them engage in increasingly effective teaching practices to support students engaging in increasingly effective learning practices. And, uh, you know, our interest in that came together 
but just at the time that uh, the faculty guild was looking for a partner uh, like Lumen and things came together uh, really quickly as these things go and we're super excited about how that's all worked. Uh, Julie, if you'll go on to the next slide. Sure. As, as we've talked with customers that had worked with Faculty Guild before, um, you know, there's a lot that they liked about Faculty Guild and there were some, uh, you know, some feedback they had, some constructive feedback for how things could be improved and you can see these here. Um, the Faculty Guild customers really love the platform. The platform, as you'll see in a minute, is really custom designed to support this kind of collaborative uh, fellowship-based approach to professional development. Um, the amount of research that underpins it, this evidence-based work done by uh, Gail Mello and uh, her colleagues is really powerful and is great. And the facilitation uh, that Faculty Guild was doing was excellent. Um, but some of the feedback that we did hear was that, you know, it, the pricing was sort of unsustainable. It was too high uh, for people to be able to adopt at scale at their institution. Um, the level of effort uh, for faculty was more than faculty were, uh, uh, thought they were signing up for uh, originally. And the, the Faculty Guild offering was really kind of uh, about effective teaching and learning broadly. Uh, but of course, in the current climate, there's need uh, for some much more specific kind of professional development, for example, around uh, making the move to online teaching and doing that successfully. Uh, so, Julie, if you will launch the next poll for us here, let's just grab a little more uh, background from you guys about what you're uh, thinking and feeling about professional development, what some of your experience has been there. So, if you'll Take a moment and answer the poll. The poll is live. So the first question here, I guess I can narrate this. Have you ever participated in the following types of faculty professional development activities? And this is select all of these that you have done in the past. There are several different options there. Yeah, but that looks like you'll need to scroll down to answer the second question. Yeah, and then the second question is, yep, requires a little bit of a scroll, but compared to your situation one year ago, how interested are you in professional development opportunities? All right, we're getting nearly everybody in. All right, it looks like we've got pretty close to everyone. So we'll go ahead and end the poll and share the results. So uh, conferences, in-person training and virtual training are all pretty uh, popular. Most everybody's been in those kinds of experiences. Um, about half doing mentoring, coaching and peer learning activities. Uh, and a few people, about a third have done reflective teaching activities, so that's great. Mm -hmm. And then uh, compared to a year ago, uh, we have people either about the same or more interested and nobody is less interested. So I guess that bodes well. All right. That's great. Thanks. All right, let's, let's move on. Here we go. So we want to talk you through, um, you know, the overall kind of setup and design of this particular approach to professional development and take you through the platform a little bit. So that's what we're gonna do now. Um, the, the Lumen Circles approach really builds on and extends the, the model that Faculty Guild had developed, um, which was really at its core about reflective teaching, about uh, becoming familiar with some evidence-based practices uh, for, for ways to effectively support student learning, uh, going into the classroom, doing some teaching, coming back, reflecting on those experiences, and sharing those reflections with others in uh, your circle, and getting feedback and support and ideas and brainstorming uh, from them. So just in the same way that you really wish that your students would, would study, would do the homework, would get your feedback, would really reflect and think about that feedback and try to figure out how to move forward and improve, uh, it's a very similar model. Uh, what Lumen has really added to that is this notion of doing some, some topical skill building uh, and integrating 
the learning on specific topics and having the reflection be slightly more specific so that in addition to just thinking about how can I improve my teaching generally, uh, it becomes more about how can I improve my teaching in, in some specific ways or some specific areas. Um, if you'll go on, Julie. Um, so the kind of timeline of how this works is at the beginning of the circle experience, uh, you choose a particular area of focus and you'll join a circle that's dedicated to that uh, topic. So it could be online teaching or OER and open pedagogy, uh, active learning, something like that. And toward the top, at the beginning of that circle, in the first week or two, there's some initial skill building that happens around that topic area. And that ideally happens uh, right before the semester begins. Uh, so you get that skill building done just as your classes are starting. And then you go into class armed with some of these uh, new skills and you do some teaching and you come back and you reflect. So classes start, you teach and apply the new skills, you come back weekly and engage in a pretty structured reflection process. And I'll show you what that structure looks like in a moment. And you do that reflection and then you share that reflection out with others in your circle uh, who give you feedback, you know, both positive and encouraging and also give you some ideas on ways that you can improve. And then uh, you know, part of that reflection ultimately becomes thinking about the progress that you're making as a teacher and the impact that that growth that you're experiencing as a teacher is having on student learning. Um, then throughout the entire experience, there is a facilitator who's in there working with you, who's also providing feedback to you, who's kind of keeping the circle moving forward at the same time. There's that community of peers that I talked about. Um, this broader framework uh, that we're going to look at in the next slide around these evidence-based teaching practices. And then mentors and recommended resources. There will be, you know, readings and thing, videos, things like that are, that are linked out to. And you'll, throughout the entire fellowship, use this uh, virtual platform, which is really designed specifically su for supporting this kind of interaction. So if we take a look at this list of evidence-based practices, you'll see uh, that they're broken into four categories. And they're kind of in two pairs. The first pair is creating a classroom environment that's supportive and creating a classroom environment that is challenging. And those might seem like um, they're kind of opposite ends of the spectrum, but they're really not. Uh, so under uh, creating a supportive classroom, we have ideas like caring, helping build community, explicitly supporting students in their transition to college, um, creating an inclusive environment, and helping students enjoy uh, you know, what they're doing there. On the challenging side, uh, there are uh, things around gathering baseline knowledge through pretests or other kind of pre-assessments so that you know where students are beginning and you're able to use that information to adapt and adjust how you teach. Uh, assessment practices, giving feedback, encouraging students to engage in self-reflection, setting and communicating to them really high expectations of uh, you know, what you believe they're capable of achieving and being really specific and kind of purposive about getting them to engage in higher order thinking. The other pair of uh, these evidence-based practices are creating one around creating a classroom environment that really varies in ways that are appropriate to meet the needs of all the diverse learners that are in your class. And then creating a classroom that's really organized where there's a structure uh, and things are very clear and things make, make sense to students. And so you can see here that under varied that's things like, you know, uh, again, purposefully looking for ways to differentiate instruction, uh, not just lecturing all the time, but finding multiple modes of doing instruction, contextualization and helping students understand how things connect to the real world, getting students collaborating and working together, and then helping students become kind of more uh, adaptive in their ability to use the things that they're learning in a range of contexts. Uh, on the organized side, you know, just structuring lessons so that there is a plan and there's thoughtfulness that's gone into that. Uh, connections is about helping students connect the things they're learning to each other and out to the broader world. Making sure that students are spending productive time on tasks, working on the kinds of things that are actually going to support their learning. And uh, scaffolding, which is about helping them move from kind of easier to harder to more uh, difficult uh, versions of tasks and having those be no stakes, lower stakes, and higher stakes in terms of the impact on the grades that they receive in the class. 
So let's see the platform uh, for a second. We've got just a couple of screenshots here. Uh, the first of uh, uh, David, before we do that, um, I had a, just a couple questions that I think are worth slotting in right here. So one question from Steve Greenlaw, how much time per week do you anticipate faculty investing? About two hours. Our goal, our goal is to not ask for more than two hours of you. Now, if you're the kind of person who loves to write and loves to reflect, and Steve, I, I know you have a little bit of this in you, uh, you know, if, if you really get into it, you might find that you are spending more than that. Um, but you should be able to engage uh, successfully in a way that supports your growth and development at a rate of about two hours a week. And then one other question, is the intention, you've gone through this uh, framework, is the intention that people are, you know, mastering or applying everything in this framework over the course of, you know, the, the Lumen Circles period, or, is, you know, is it, uh, is it something that people are, are learning about? You know, how comprehensive is that? Yeah. Um, so the answer to the first question is no. The goal isn't, you know, during my nine weeks, can I demonstrate using each of these approaches in one of my classes? It's not a, not necessarily a more is better. You know, if three, doing three of these in a, in a class session is good, then doing 12 of them is better. Um, part of it is about helping you kind of learn that there are, there are names for things that you're probably already doing and connecting you to some of the literature around that. That's a pretty common experience to, to say, oh, I do that. I didn't, know, I didn't know this was a thing. I didn't know it had a name. I didn't know that people had researched about it before and I can go learn more about, about how to do that. And part of it, particularly in the early uh, weeks of the fellowship, is just around teaching the way that you teach and understanding some of these things that you learned how to do either intuitively or you, you know, saw, had a a great teacher when you were a student who modeled some of this for you. Um, so part of it's about getting a baseline for yourself of your own teaching and which of these strategies that you employ. And then based on your teaching style, based on your discipline, based on the kinds of students that you work with, looking at these and pulling out, you know, individual pieces that you can bring into your class that you can synthesize into something that really makes sense and that will move, uh, you know, your students learning forward. It's not about trying to combine all of this into one giant gumbo where you know, there's 20 ingredients uh, uh, in this soup. It really is meant to be more uh, kind of strategic and to give you a box of tools from which uh, you can pull as you're kind of crafting your, your classroom instruction. All right, and then one more question I think that fits well here. How many participants are in each circle? Are these large or small groups in general? They're small in general, about a dozen about a dozen. So there's enough, um, you know, that there are plenty of people for you to get to know. There's some variety in the types of reflections of other fellows that you're reading and that you're giving feedback to, um, but not so big that it becomes, you know, difficult for you to know everyone, to get to know them over the course of the term. Uh, not so big that it's difficult to build some community and particularly some trust uh, among the people in the circle so that pretty quickly you're able to feel like you can not just talk about things that worked well in your class, but you can start sharing things that didn't work um, and feel like th it's, this is a safe space for you to do that. And you can get some, you know, some good feedback and support from other people in the group. So around a dozen. All right, excellent. And then one other question, and, and I think as we go into the platform, it might be a good way to start answering this question. Um, this one also comes from our friend Steve. Why should schools outsource faculty development when they are presumably doing it in-house and what's special about Lumen Circles? And so I think that's a nice entree actually into the, uh, the platform and, and how the pieces come together. Yeah, you know, it, it's interesting, Steve. The, um, I would say a couple of things. Uh, one is that not all schools actually have a center for teaching and learning and don't necessarily have the capacity that they wish they had to do as much professional development as they'd like to do. Um, I think there's also something about being able to, in terms of building trust and being able to share things that are not working in your classroom uh, and just being a, feeling comfortably, comfortable being a little more open and honest, sometimes that's easier when you're with colleagues who teach in the same discipline, but at a different institution, um, where some you can maybe 
let off some steam and not worry that that's going to come right around back to your department head or to your dean or something like that. That kind of commiserating about what's happening on the ground is definitely part of the, the community building uh, piece of that. I, I don't think that the goal of Lumen Circles is to replace the good work that's already being done on your campus. Um, but I do think that it is about trying to scale that up and particularly to give you some opportunities to participate in this kind of peer-based collaborative work with people outside your institution where you can not just have the steam blowing off part of that, but really get some genuinely different perspectives uh, on solutions that have worked for, for other people that are just working in a context that's really different from yours. So there's some variety there. All right, we, we've got a couple more questions. I think uh, I wanna have David uh, go in and do a quick preview of the, of the platform and show you what that looks like. And then that provides a little bit more context. We can come back and address a couple of the, the additional questions that are, that are posed. So you wanna keep going, David? Yeah, so this, um, you know, so this is what the, the kind of dashboard looks like. At, when you're a fellow in the experience, you'll see that um, the prompt this week is, this is a week that's early, uh, and this is, I should say that this is uh, demo content. This isn't a real person whose data we're showing. This is kind of demonstration content and, and made up people and things like that. Um, but you know, here this is toward the beginning where the encouragement is to get into the groove of the reflection process and pay attention to a couple of things specifically as you're doing that, and there's some prompting here. Um, under that first paragraph, you see the list of action items. Uh, the act, there are three items that this person has kind of queued up from them this week. One is to do their own reflection, which they've already done, which is why that button is green and says view, um, as opposed to being blue and saying reflect, which is what it would be if they hadn't done the reflection yet. Uh, then at the two down, you see there's a blue collaborate button. This is uh, over on the right there, you see Tim Sloan. Tim Sloan has already come in and written his reflection for the week. And this week, um, I can't remember what this person's made up name is, but this user uh, in the circle has been paired with Tim and with Peter. And so they're gonna be providing feedback on each other's reflection. So Tim's reflection is in, and so that button's turned blue and it's ready uh, for you to click collaborate and jump in and read through their reflection, and provide them some feedback. Uh, Peter looks like hasn't written his reflection yet, so we're still waiting uh, for that to happen. But it's all mapped out in this dashboard so that you just come in, you see here, you see what you're supposed to do at a high level. When you click in to reflect, there's a bit more of a prompt uh, there. We'll look at that in just a sec. But really the core of the experience is doing this reflection and then providing some feedback and some additional reflection on other people's reflections. Each week you're paired with uh, different people so that you're getting to know different people in the circle. That doesn't mean that you can't go, like if something about Tim and the work that he's doing seems really interesting to you, you can always go back and look at Tim's uh, each week and provide comments and feedback if you want to. Um, there's also a, a great feature in here that uh, where you can take a break. And if we click in uh, in a minute, we might be able to see that where if you know you're gonna be traveling for a conference or something like that in a week that you're able to just say, I'm taking a break this week and then the system doesn't pair you up with other people who are depending on you writing your reflection or waiting for your feedback, things like that. So all of the kind of pairing up, collaborating, reflecting is managed in this, in this one dashboard. Uh, on the next screen, there's a view of what that structured reflection process looks like after it's been completed. Oh, Rachel, that's her name. Um, you know, so you see here the reflection is asking you, you know, talk about what were the things that you wanted students to learn, what was it that you did in the class, what were the activities that occurred, and how are they connected to your learning objectives, how did you know that students learned what you were hoping they would learn, uh, what are the specific instructional practices that you implemented, uh, were there any kind of ideas that people had suggested that you implemented this time around, and then finally just talk through what worked, what didn't work, why you think that was true, both for you and for the students. And in the activities here, you can see some, in the middle of the words, you can see some icons that are pulled out here. Those uh, are those evidence-based practices. Um, so you can see here that in describing the activities that they did in class, they're saying, well, you know, I use this real world example, which um, I now know is uh, this idea of contextualization. Um, 
I then I had students work had a couple students work at the board and then I talked through the mistakes that they made and showed the whole class some shortcuts of how to do that then I gave them some hand some handouts that they could work on and I went around kind of as they raised their hands and helped so that's like a scaffolding kind of approach so as you're describing what you're doing in each of these steps you can be pulling in and tagging uh, your description with uh, these evidence-based practices and this is one of the ways that they make their way in here um, and if you'll go to the next slide Julie uh, on the left hand side here you see it says learning objectives and there's a little icon below that activities there's a little icon below that at any time you can click on this icon and get um, this kind of just-in-time support of I know I'm supposed to describe the activities that occurred but like what specifically do I say and so there's a little rubric here that you can use to kind of evaluate your own writing as to help you be more effective in your own reflecting. Here are some of the things that you ought to be thinking about as you're engaged in this reflection process. And that kind of support is available uh, for each of the pieces of this structured reflection. Uh, and again, these evidence-based practices, this particular approach to scaffolding reflection uh, is all based on the, the work that uh, Gail Mello and her colleagues published in their book, uh, Taking College Teaching Seriously. All right, before we, we have a quick poll that we'll do next, but before we do that, there's a couple of more questions that Great. I think are, are worth uh, asking right now. So uh, first one, of all the learning practices listed, and I can go back to my, whoops, hold on, let me go back to the learning practices slide here. Yeah. Uh, which one does evidence show is the most impactful for students? Ah, uh, that is in fact a trick question. Uh, because it has very much to do with the students. Um, for example, you can imagine if you're working with a group of students um, who were not particularly successful academically in high school, uh, maybe you've got them in a developmental English class or a developmental math class, that transition to college skill under supportive is going to be super important uh, to, to work with them on and will be really impactful for them. Uh, on the other hand, if you're at a highly selective college where everybody who's coming in had straight A's in high school and you know 30 plus on their ACT, you could do a bunch of the transition to college things in your classroom, but they probably won't have the same degree of impact uh, as the students who already know that things like you know tutoring labs exist and I know to ask for help when I need help. So it, it really, you know, each of these depends on the kinds of students you have, the kind of context you're working in, the discipline that you're working in, uh, honestly. You know, the John, there's, there's a fellow called John Hattie, H-A-T-T-I-E, uh, who runs a website called Visible, the website is visible-learning.org. And if you visit his site, he's done this series of meta-meta analyses where he's gone in and looked at the impact on student learning of a wide range of things. And he actually just has a giant table where they're sorted by effect size. So um, if that's the kind of, if that's the kind of thing you'd like to learn more about, which, which is the best under all circumstances for all students in all classes, um, you know, John Hattie's work might be interesting to you. But in the, in the context of the circles, everything really is highly context dependent, which is why the answer isn't just, yes, go do all 20 of these things and, and then student learning will improve. All right, and one more question. Um, how does Lumen work with existing instructional design teams? Lumen does, uh, well, that's a really broad question too because there's, a, there's an answer to that on the courseware side of what Lumen does. Um, and then there's an answer to that on the circle side. And honestly, I don't, I can't give you a really coherent answer to how that works on the Lumen circle side, how we, are going to work and collaborate with instructional designers and other people that might be doing professional development on campus because we haven't tried that yet. Uh, so if there are people on your campus who are interested in doing that, we'd love to, to have those conversations and start to figure out how those collaborations could be fruitful and, and useful for everybody that's involved. But um, we haven't done it yet, so I'm not sure how to answer. Yeah, what, one thing that I, I will just layer onto that, um, in, the, in making the decision to go this direction with Lumen Circles and to go through with the acquisition of Faculty Guild, we had a lot of exploratory conversations with um, just a, a, a variety of different 
people on in sitting in different roles on campuses, some of whom were familiar with faculty guilds, some were not, um, some had familiarity with Lumen generally, some were somewhat new to Lumen, so there was an interesting mix. Um, one of the things that helped us with the shaping of, of and the design of where we're landing with these Lumen Circles experiences um, was conversations from uh, instructional design folks, uh, teaching and learning center folks saying, you know, there, there are some things that we can do ourselves in house and there are other areas that are real gaps that uh, either, you know, for bandwidth or expertise or not things that they necessarily um, could do themselves, but wanted to provide um, support for their faculty members. And, and so that's, that's a piece of what we're doing is, is saying, you know, we're, we're filling gaps that, that may not um, be available within uh, campus's own resources. The other uh, big thing that we heard a lot of, though, is um, a lot of these folks were saying, you know, they'll hear it from me in one way, but what will really make a bigger difference is if they hear feedback or they have opportunities to share ideas and grow with people from other institutions. Um, and so that's another place that um, having, you know, guidance and, and discernment from those teams who know their faculty, who know, you know, who are the folks that are already responding well to the in-house resources and who are the folks that would really benefit from that broader peer learning circle experience to be able to expand their teaching or hear things differently in terms of how they can grow with that, that broader set of a, a virtual learning circle where they're engaging with peers outside of their own institution. So like David said, we're gonna learn a lot more as we go, um, but there are definitely some pieces here that, that we see as complementary to the great work that's already happening on so many campuses from those teams. Yeah, it does, it does feel like there's space for something that fits somewhere between uh, you know, a once a month kind of lunchbox workshop where you go over to the CTL and they feed you a free lunch and you spend an hour talking about whatever. Uh, you know, something between that kind of lunch and learn and getting a master's degree in education, right? Something in between there. And there's honestly, there's just not a lot of uh, a kind of sustained, ongoing, collaborative, uh, longer engagements. So I think there is a really interesting spot uh, in the middle where Lumen Circles is going to fit. All right, thank you. Uh, let's see. I have a poll here. We, we have a hand raiser as well. I'm just looking at my. Um, uh, someone has raised their hand and I'm looking for the place where it says that I can let them talk. Um, um, <laughs> this is where we've, we've hit the limits of my Zoom skills. And uh, let's see, the person who raised their hand, okay, disregard the hand, okay. So great. there was some, uh, sounds good. Thank you, Frank. Um, all right, we have a quick poll. This is our last poll. Uh, so take a moment. Um, this poll, I will also note, is anonymous. Um, there is one question that we, as we were putting it together, we're actually really interested in the, in the answers, but thought we didn't want to create sensitivities for folks if they're nervous about being able to link their name to the answer to this question. So I've launched the poll. Uh, so take a moment and respond. So the first question here, which of the following have been part of your institution's key priorities for faculty over the past year? This one you can select all that apply. So you can take a look at uh, a variety of different kind of trends or, or strategies that we're seeing a lot with. And then the second question, how would you rate your institution's performance so far at supporting faculty professional development needs during the pandemic? We'll give folks a moment to respond. And let's see, looks like things are settling out. So people that have wanted to respond have done. So oh, a couple more coming in. All right, I think we'll go ahead and end the poll since these are not terribly scientific. 
All right, so uh, responding to the first question. Um, so about half um, have seen active learning come up, uh, adaptive and personalized learning, uh, um, not quite a quarter. Diversity, equity, inclusion has been uh, a big focus for about three quarters of folks here. Uh, learning and analytics um, for about a third, open educational resources, more than half. That's probably not surprising with, uh, with the Lumen um, audience here, at least many of you. Um, teaching online, uh, strong, uh, strong emphasis there, transition to digital materials, uh, about a third, just over a third. And then universal use of learning management systems, about half have seen a big focus there. So thank you for that, very interesting. And then how would you rate your institution's performance? Um, so about a third have found it's excellent, 41% um, 40 good, and then equal numbers of fair and poor. So uh, down in the 14% range. So thank you. Oh, uh, sorry, I'm reading it and not sharing. I apologize for that. <laughs> so you guys can take a look at that for a moment. David, any comments before we uh, stop the poll and move on? Uh, not on the poll, no, but uh, Janelle had a, a question in the Q&A that I thought if I could share my oh, screen sure. for a minute, uh, I can answer. She's asking, what does the content of the circles look like? Okay. Uh, do you want to share directly? Yeah. Okay, let me stop sharing then. So um, it, the, con the content, uh, the question is, what does the content of the circles look like? And the, the content really takes a couple of forms, maybe three forms primarily. Um, so the first is you know, these evidence-based tags that can be applied in your reflections. And so if we want to learn more about caring, for example, there's a blurb here about caring, um, which will be enough uh, to communicate the core idea. But then there are resources here as well. And so if I click on resources, I can come over and I can see, um, you know, here is, uh, you know, an article from Brookings. Here's another article from the Chronicle of Higher Ed. Here's some resources about that uh, that have been curated that you can take a deeper dive. Um, but in some ways, even uh, more interesting than that is the facilitator of each circle, when they see really excellent examples of someone who's written a, re a reflection where they did a great job of actually demonstrating care in their classroom, can nominate a reflection as an exemplar. And then the person who wrote it um, can either decline uh, you know, that kind of nomination as an exemplar or can say, I'm comfortable with my reflection being used as an exemplar. Um, either globally, anybody can come and look at it even if they're not logged in or only for people, other people within my circle. There's some sharing settings that that they can adapt there. But this kind of core content that is the same across all the topical circles um, takes, takes the structure of there being kind of a, a fairly concise summary, some curated resources, and then some exemplars of other people who have written um, you know, their own reflections that the facilitator of their circle thought really did a great job. Um, so these will, will cut across all circles. And then in the other circles, we talked about um, that kind of topical skill building. So in the online teaching foundations, uh, for example, we spend some time at the beginning of that circle looking at OSCAR, which is the, uh, the Open SUNY course quality uh, review rubric and talking through some of the principles there. And then a little later on in the circle, spend some time uh, in, a cup, in some curated resources specifically chosen for online, the Online Teaching Foundation Circle to get into more of the detail there. So Janelle, hopefully that answers your question of, of what the content looks like. David, do you want to keep driving? Oh, sure. And we're on 21 for this slide. All right. So that was, um, that was a great, uh, segue into this next part of the conversation. Um, and so I will pick things up here, which is painting just a little bit more vivid picture of what the circles look like and the different flavors of Lumen circles that, that we're bringing together. So could you go to the next slide? 
So the, the sort of flagship offering that it's most like what uh, Faculty Guild had offered previously, um, these are what we call our Lumen Circles Fellowships. And the duration of these is nine weeks. And so as David had mentioned, there's a couple of weeks where there's some activity and skill building happening before classes start. And then as classes start, the reflective teaching picks up. Um, the audience for these is really any faculty member and, and they choose an area or a theme that they want to delve into or, or further expand their teaching capabilities. Um, so the themes that we are focusing on for this fall, um, they are listed here. So online teaching foundations, um, evidence-based teaching, which is really that framework that David reviewed. And again, that, that evidence-based teaching is a consistent framework through all of these. Uh, but some of them will have, uh, you know, another flavor layered on top of that. So the online teaching in the first one, um, there's a, a flavor of the evidence-based teaching that hones in on Lumen courseware. So folks that are using some of the Lumen tools specifically, um, well, how do you use some of those tool sets to, uh, to kind of go deeper into those, those uh, evidence-based and student-focused uh, student practices. Um, OER and open pedagogy is another uh, theme diversity, equity, inclusion, and active learning. And um, for each of these, we also are uh, going to be offering a certification process. So as people complete these fellowships, they'll have a, a certificate in effective teaching practice that aligns with the theme that they've selected. And then our, our cost uh, is listed here. Um, we're trying to be really competitive in terms of pricing. Um, and so it's $750 for a first term. And then if folks want to add on a term, either doing a second term in the same theme or choosing a, a second theme in a, in a subsequent term, um, then there's a, a nice cost break there. Uh, could you go on to the, let's yeah. see. Um, sorry, there's a, a quick question. Will there be any possibility to, for scholarship or free registration opportunities? Um, that's, that's a good question. Um, right now, we are kind of getting our, our feet wet and understanding um, kind of the bigger picture. I know there are some organizations that we've been in conversations with, like Every Learner Everywhere and the Gates Foundation around possibilities for some um, funding associated, uh, you know, with, um, in, in particular, some of the pandemic response and, and equipping faculty members um, with more skills and professional development. So as we're learning more about what those look like, we'll certainly um, be reaching out. Um, so we'll keep people posted. Eventually we would love to be able to, um, to offer scholarships and, and that type of thing. We, we need to kind of prove it out and then hopefully have more opportunities for that. Uh, and then, okay, next question. Do you have to register in the next offer term to qualify for the discount? Um, Right now, the way that we've been modeling that is yes. So it, you would need to have uh, kind of subsequent uh, consecutive terms to qualify for the discount. That's something that we, um, we may explore over time and, and see if we have some, some flexibility in that. Uh, but that's a really good question. All of this is still relatively new and we're ironing <laughs> yeah. things out. So uh, we're also in the, um, you know, you come to us with a deal and, you know, we'll, we'll talk about it kind of thing. So, um, and as we're, you know, kind of painting the bigger picture of where this is heading. Um, so a second flavor of, uh, of what we're offering with the same set of tools is something that we're calling success accelerator. And this is ex expressly for people that are using uh, Lumen's Waymaker, our own courseware. Um, and the goal here is to provide a faster path to ha having, you know, really effective teaching and effective, you know, impact on student success. Again, using that set of courseware tools. Um, we're also conscious that people who are starting to use these tool sets in particular, um, sometimes the learning curve can be a little bit daunting. And so um, some of the feedback that we heard was, you know, it'd be great if you could have this tool set, but not force people into this, you know, this two month long reflective teaching when they've got their hands full trying to make the most of a new, new tool set. And so Success Accelerator, while it's not only for people that are brand new to these types of course where we wanted something that would provide 
a few things. So that, that kind of broader uh, introduction to help them understand effective teaching practice and how learning happens and how the courseware tools um, can deliver that more effectively as they're thinking about course design and student engagement and learning activities. Um, and to then also though provide them with the, the benefit of a peer community that's learning and doing the same kinds of things, sharing effective practices, asking common questions, um, and having the benefit of that cohort as they're getting started with those tools. So this one is a duration of just five weeks, uh, so it's a little bit shorter, it's, it's on the front end, although the access to that peer community um, will extend throughout the term. So that five weeks are when you have, you know, kind of weekly assignments and check-ins and so forth with the group. And then from there, you, you can kind of move at your own pace or engage with the community um, as, as needed. Uh, and so this one is uh, $350 a seat, um, and we're anticipating people would do this for two consecutive terms. Um, and the second term, if they want to opt into one of the, the full-on circles, instead of saying and staying in Success Accelerator, they can do that at no additional cost. Um, there's also an option to uh, bundle the cost of this in with the, the courseware fee. So essentially a bundled fee that provides these additional levels of support for the faculty member to implement effectively. And so, you know, either of those is an option. Uh, let's see, and then I'm gonna touch on the last one and then we'll come back and get more questions. Uh, so the, the final flavor of this is what we're calling Crescendo Circle. And so this is, we recognize that there's a great tool set. Um, one of the things that David didn't show, um, but there's a really nice feature of the platform is there's a way to, to showcase and to track what your, how, how is your pedagogy, how are your practices expanding and, and evolving over time. And in a way that you can even download and show that as part of a, you know, a, your tenure review or as part of, um, as part of your CV, for example. Um, and or, so, Julie, if I can interject just for a second, or yeah. if you're putting together a accreditation report and they're yeah. looking for how you've been thoughtful about practice and how you've documented your improvements there. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so we, we want to have a way for people to come into or to stay engaged in the community, whether it's engaging with their, their peers or being able to continue to grow on more of a, a self-paced practice um, as they're evolving their pedagogy. And so, uh, so this is a place where, you know, for a, a pretty low annual, uh, you know, membership, you can have continued access to the tools. Uh, engage with the community. And then we also anticipate adding some uh, professional development events and optional reflection activities, things that are kind of benefits of, of the just being part of that community to continue to grow and enrich your teaching practice. Um, so that's what that flavor looks like. And, and anybody who's been through either of the Success Accelerator or a full Lumen Circle um, would be able to come into the, the community and be part of that. All right, uh, so um, this is just kind of a side-by-side -side look at what we just had spoken about. Um, and I, we've got another question or two. Do you wanna go, the next screen is basically just, what are your thoughts? What feedback do you have? What questions do you have? Um, so a question from Regina, what about access to the platform and the resources for faculty after they've completed the nine week course, will they lose it? So Regina, you anticipated what I just was talking about. Um, so anybody that's uh, in one of the one of those fellowships or the success accelerator, they have access to everything through the end of that term. And so you think of, you know, sort of July or August through December and then January through June. Um, so there are those those consistent blocks where they'll have access to it. And then at the end of the term, if they choose not to continue, um, they they would potentially lose it or they can opt into the um, into the crescendo circle. Um, we also have had folks that have been asking about, you know, is there sort of an enterprise version of the crescendo circle where, you know, an institution might pay some amount and then everybody that's coming through um, would, would be able to have that continuing access. And so that's also something that we're, you know, we're putting into proposals and so forth as we get it requested. Um, okay, a question, what's the difference between the Lumen circles and AQ's effective practice framework? Um, David, is that one you would like to take? Um, how, yeah, I'm, 
I haven't actually ever answered that question out loud yet, so I'm going to stumble around a little bit here. Um, I, I would think that the kind of the primary difference is the emphasis on application, on, you know, working through things, taking them immediately into the classroom, trying them out, coming back, reflecting, talking with other people. Um, but that applied piece of it, I think, would be kind of the main differentiator, just as is my first response to that question. I, I should get better at answering that question, probably. Yeah, I, th I think um, this is also one of the things that uh, this is this is why I punted to you uh, to see how you would answer. Um, I, I will say that the underlying framework, there are a lot of similarities where you're looking, whether you're looking at, you know, AQ or even a quality matters or some of the other frameworks that are out there. Um, the, the notion of, of, you know, what are effective practices, there is a reasonable amount of consistency there. And, and so really what we're trying to do is you know provide a useful and, and helpful and kind of universal framework that any faculty member in any discipline uh, could benefit from. Um, but providing what's unique, like David said, is the set of activities around that to help apply, to help engage, to help people build a habit as they are going through their teaching practice um, of being thoughtful about their choices and understanding the, the broader pedagogical purposes of those. Um, as we've been talking to institutions about this offering, a lot of the feedback we've had is saying, you know, this is really interesting, uh, it, not instead of AQ necessarily, but in addition, or saying I have certain, there are certain faculty or certain groups or certain needs where this set of things is going to be more effective than what an AQ would offer. There are other places where what AQ is offering uh, or, you know, iDesign or some of the other great groups that are out there that what they're doing is a better fit for purpose and for the individuals who are involved. Um, and so like David said, that, that virtual learning circle, the richness of the peer experience, being able to apply and come back and have it be something that is, you know, kind of built into what you do for a little bit more extended period. Um, it is, is definitely a kind of a, a, a different take on, on what we're trying to do to accomplish there. Um, another question, Lumen's perspective on received concerns about Zoom security specifically and the possibility embedded virtual conferencing within the Lumen learning framework. Uh, Wade, would you take just a, a second and say a little bit more about what you're asking there? I'm not sure I understand the question. All right, we are at the top of the hour. So Wade, feel free to add a little bit more in there and we can stay on for a moment and, and answer that. Um, the last thing I just want to say is thank you so much for your time. Um, if you registered, we will be sending out a, a recording so you will have it. If you wanna share it with others who might be interested, that would be great. Um, with that, there'll be a, a cover note um, of if there is, if you'd like to learn more, if you'd like to reach out, if you're interested for yourself or, or for your organization, um, feel free to respond and we would love to talk further about what we're doing. So thanks everybody. Have a great rest of your day. Yeah, and Wade has said that uh, he'll just grab us offline. Okay, awesome. So, so. Thanks so much. Thanks everyone.